Israel started a new phase of war against Hamas on Saturday with an expansion of ground troops into Gaza. Since Hamas's barbaric attack on Israel on October 7th, over 1,400 Israeli civilians have been killed and over 200 hostages taken by the terrorist group. It's estimated that thousands of Palestinians have been killed and the densely populated enclave is in the state of a humanitarian disaster without consistent electricity, food and water. Gershom Goenberg is an Israeli-American historian and journalist based in Jerusalem and has covered Middle Eastern affairs for over 30 years. He wrote an essay for the New York Times this month, Netanyahu led us to catastrophe. He must go. He joins us now. Welcome. In your piece for the New York Times, you address pivotal questions like how did Israel's leaders, specifically Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, let it happen? How did the Hamas atrocities happen? Where did Netanyahu go wrong? Look, I think there's two levels of this. One is the immediate level of the last few months, and one is the longer uh, story of a failed strategy and conception. The story of the last few months is that Netanyahu returned to the prime minister's office uh, at the very end of last year uh, with the both the most extreme and the least competent government he's had in his many years as prime minister. Uh, the reasons that the government, to start with, is not competent is that competent people didn't want to be a part of it um, and that it's same for it being most extreme. Uh, many of the parties in the Israeli system in the center who in the past were willing to join coalitions with Netanyahu were unwilling to do so uh, while he is on trial for on serious corruption charges, which uh, they see as disqualifying him to be prime minister. Um, and because of a long record of broken promises and uh, backstabbing when they were in previous governments. So the only parties that would join him were the ultra-Orthodox parties and the parties of the extreme religious nationalist right. Uh, in addition to that, his own Likud party has steadily shed competent ministerial material as former allies have walked out, have grown frustrated with Netanyahu's leadership and have left. Um, leaving what I would call a party of lackeys. It's become, instead of the Likud of old, which was a right-wing conservative party, but a party built around ideas, and that to a certain extent had a range of ideas within it, it's become more and more the party of the personality around Netanyahu, as people who disagreed with him felt that they had no place uh, in the party and could not work with him. Um, so you get a government of, of people who are distinctly unqualified. Um, the priorities of that government became, uh, first of all, transferring funds to the ultra-Orthodox community to pay off their allegiance to the government, um, building settlements, and the highest priority, changing Israel's political system, essentially regime change. The government, Netanyahu and those around him call this judicial reform, but the point of the changes in the judicial system was to remove checks and balances and to leave the executive branch basically free to do whatever it wanted. Um, that plan set off huge national protests um, and became the almost sole focus of the government. Uh, and it's pretty clear that because of the focus on that, Netanyahu simply wasn't paying attention to security issues. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's the immediate background. The larger background is that since Netanyahu began his long uh, run as prime minister in 2009, I'll say in parentheses, he was prime minister between 96 and 99. For 10 years, he was out of, out of office in 2009. He returned to office and he's since been prime minister for 13 out of the last 14 years. Um, since he returned to office in 2009, his policy has been to regard Hamas rule in Gaza as an asset. Hamas took over the Gaza Strip in a uh, essentially a coup in 2007, uh, driving out the uh, West Bank based uh, Palestinian Authority. The Palestinian Authority is led by President Mahmoud Abbas, 
who has always favored a two-state outcome. Hamas is totally opposed to any compromise with Israel and to the very existence of Israel. The Hamas takeover in Gaza divided the Palestinians and made it practically and politically far more difficult to think about a two-state outcome, practically because the Palestinian Authority in Ramallah was no longer speaking for Gaza, and politically because that split led Israelis to say, who are we negotiating with? There's Mm -hmm. no longer one representative of the Palestinians. Let's say you make peace with Abbas. You sign a treaty. He doesn't control Gaza. Hamas will keep fighting us. Um, From the point of view of Netanyahu, who despite public zigzagging over the years in policy terms, has always opposed a Palestinian state. This split was an asset. And uh, he, at least on one occasion in a, in a Likud caucus meeting in the Knesset, said as much that the split helped prevent the existence of a Palestinian state. People around him have said as much. His far-right coalition partner, Bitsala Smotrich, uh, said at one point in an interview, um, if I remember correctly, in 2015, that Hamas is an asset and the Palestinian Authority is a burden on Israel um, because the Palestinian Authority, in Smotrich's rigid right-wing view, prevented the threat of diplomatic activity and, and progress toward a two-state outcome, whereas Hamas prevented that from happening. That whole conception led to complacency toward Hamas rule in Gaza and and toward not taking any steps to restore Palestinian authority rule in Gaza. Um, and at least according to some inside reports, actively trying to um, a, a prevent such a reunification or make it more difficult for it to happen. Um, mm-hmm. So that left Hamas in power in in Gaza and created an attitude of we can live with that. We can manage the conflict. We can go on like this indefinitely. Now, you you touched upon this a bit, but you wrote in your, your New York Times piece that the prime minister had a blindness to the dangers of Hamas and that it was a strategic choice of his. The blindness. and And you said it was that that Hamas was working as an asset. Can you can you further clarify that? Well, what I mean is uh, by it being an asset in his in his point of view. Let me stress here. I'm mm-hmm. explaining his point of view, not my own. Of course. <laughs> was that the existence of the Hamas rule, separate rule in Gaza, was an asset because it stood in the way of a two-state outcome and of serious diplomatic negotiations and allowed Israel to go on exerting its control over the West Bank and building settlements, which has been his program. Um, it was, I, I think, a classic situation of the of the a half-conscious alliance of extremes. Um, I, I will also say, on the other hand, which is very, very important to stress here, Hamas, uh, since the beginning of its existence, has been uh, essentially... I'm certainly not intentionally, but has essentially been an asset for the Israeli right in the sense that it has sabotaged peace negotiations. Hmm. Its terror attacks during the Oslo period uh, um, led to greater support for the Israeli right and to Netanyahu's first election in 1996 and to the eventual um, eroding of the Oslo process. Uh, Its takeover of Gaza, after the Israeli pullout, a a reduced support within Israel for giving up more territory. Um, The two extremes, the the sides of the of the on on each side that say, I want all of the land. It essentially strengthen each other on the other side Mm -hmm. because they make it seem to their respective publics that a compromise is impossible. so in that sense, going back to Netanyahu, Hamas rule of Gaza, uh, this, you know, absolute enemy of Israel, this group that essentially believes in the eradication of Israel, meant that the supposed threat of a negotiated solution wasn't there. Uh, and Netanyahu came to believe 
particularly after the last round of fighting in 2021 with with Gaza, that Gaza had been uh, that Hamas had been deterred from future attacks on Israel, um, and that it was essentially being bought off by by relatively minor economic uh, incentives. And once again, that the that the conflict could be managed. I would add to that that Netanyahu has always had his eye on Iran as hmm. the huge threat to Israel. And it, it's as if he's been walking around with his distance glasses on and can't read the text that's right in front of his face, which is, um, uh, you know, uh, the, the threat from Hamas. And there have been warnings from people within the Israeli political structure mm-hmm. and in public, you know, that there's this danger from Hamas that they could attack from there and whatever. Uh, but he has not paid attention to that. He has even bragged about the fact that he has deterred Hamas. Hmm. So, so we're talking about the Prime Minister of Israel and how, so in so many ways, this was about political restructuring, regime changes. Uh, it almost harkens the need for power, right? It's it's this idea of he wanting this political power. It's reminding me of a former president here in the United States. Uh, how did you shall not be named? <laughs> I think we all know. Uh, how did Israeli intelligence miss signs that Hamas was planning the October 7th attack? I mean, again, you've touched upon these things, but then you have Israeli intelligence, which is considered some of the best intelligence, one of the best intelligence agencies in the world. How were they able to miss the sign? Now, I've heard theories that um, it was due to the the underground tunnel system that Hamas was able to to sneak this away. But there was nothing considering that Hamas terrorists, they use a lot of encrypted apps like Telegram to communicate with each other and strategize. Okay, I'm going to say, let me try to remember three things I'd like to say about this. Um going in stages. The first is that one of the best Israeli strategic analysts, an ex-general named Shlomo Brom, once said to me in a different context, but also a strategic context, you have to remember that attention is also a limited resource. Hmm. Attention is a limited resource. Therefore, if you think that the threat is in a different direction, you're going to pay less attention to other threats. It's true that Israeli has Israel has an incredibly sophisticated sophisticated intelligence system, but it's not unlimited. There's not 10 million soldiers available to listen and to decode and all of those things. So if you think that the threat is mainly from terrorists in the West Bank or mainly from Iran or mainly from Hezbollah in the north, and you're not paying attention to Gaza, uh, you will get less information. Uh, so that's that's the first problem. And in this respect, I would argue that the political conception it permeated from the top down. Um, that is to say, you really have a problem here with the strategic political position of the of the political leadership affecting the military uh, allocation of resources. Um, the second thing which relates to that goes into a piece of Israeli history, a, a, a frighteningly um, 50 years past and frighteningly today piece of Israeli history, which is how Israel was taken surprise almost precisely to the day 50 years earlier by the Syrian Egyptian surprise attack on Yom Kippur in October of 1973. And the investigation of that, the State Commission of Inquiry that investigated that afterwards and academic investigations afterwards of how intelligence messed up so badly how it missed the signs that were in front of its face pointed to being captives of a conception. Now, there was a technical, practical conception that Egypt wouldn't attack until it got certain weapons from the Soviet Union that it had not received. And intelligence officials said to virtually every piece of information they got, Egypt can't attack, it doesn't have those weapons. Uh, they were imposing their own logic on Egypt, which is a classic mistake. But beyond that, there was a political misconception that controlling the Sinai Peninsula protected Israel from Egypt and created a deterrent to Egypt attacking. And that political misconception was proven uh, catastrophically wrong. 
if we fast forward to what happened today, there was a political misconception that it was possible to manage the conflict indefinitely. Uh, the metaphor I always give for this is it's like the old story of the man who jumped off of a hundred story building. And as he's passing the 30th floor, somebody says, how's it going? And he says, so far, great. Um, so we were, you know, everything was going fine, right? Until it wasn't. Mm -hmm. um, this concept that we could hold on to the West Bank, um, not engage in any attempt to resolve the conflict with the Palestinians, and use the Palestinian extremists as an asset, uh, completely collapsed. But it led to not paying attention to the evidence. And the much wider thing I want to say about intelligence is this, and I wrote a piece for the Washington Post about this a year and a half ago after the multiple intelligence failures of multiple countries in connection with the invasion of Ukraine by Russia. Um, it, and that includes the American failure, by the way, because the Americans predicted the invasion, but were completely wrong about what uh, Ukraine's ability to respond to it would be. Um, and there were a couple of things that happened here. One was the classic mistake of assuming that your enemy is thinking like you, when, of course, your enemy's job is to not think like you. Um, and there was the misreading of mood on the other side, which is something that is much, much more difficult to to read than, um, you know, a particular message between station one and station two. Um, and those kind of intelligence failures are a classic of intelligence history. I, I'll just give you uh, one example of this that is... Um, that sticks in my mind in in uh, the spring of early spring of 1940, there were multiple intelligence signs that Britain was picking up and receiving that Germany was about to invade Norway. Um, and those signs were dismissed by the British leadership, including by the then first Lord of the Admiralty, which means the naval secretary, a, a man by the name of Winston Churchill. Um, because the British logic was that Germany would only invade Norway if it were also invading Sweden. And it would need a certain number of divisions to invade both of those countries. Those divisions were not available. Therefore, it wouldn't be invading Sweden and Norway. And therefore, these were not signs of an invasion of Norway, except that Germany decided to take Norway and not to invade Sweden. And so this whole logical structure, which led to misreading the intelligence, was was incorrect. To bring that back to the current moment, the the political and strategic misconceptions it, were blinders on the eyes of the intelligence agencies and even more importantly of the political leadership. What do the Israeli people think of their prime minister? What's the overall sentiment that you've been gauging? Okay, I want to um qualify for this moment. What I always say in answer to these questions is I have never met the Israeli people. <laughs> I've met Israeli people. And I'm aware of how one sees one's own circle and even one's own circle in social media or which media you follow, even in terms of uh, solid, respectable media organizations. So judging a national mood is something that I want to be extremely uh, careful about. What I can tell you is that polling shows a tremendous drop off in support for Netanyahu. 80% uh, of the Israeli public saying that Netanyahu should publicly take responsibility for the failure, something that he has doggedly refused to do. Um, in, you know, polling that shows that if elections were held today, which is, of course, entirely theoretical in wartime, but if elections were held today, his party would lose nearly half of its support in the public, and so forth. There's, there are clear signs of a wide frustration and anger with Netanyahu, which have been exacerbated by reports coming out of warning signs that he missed or ignored, mm -hmm. and by the fact that the government has continued to be dysfunctional after the outbreak of war, that its response to the civilian problems of the war to dealing with the families that had to be evacuated from border towns and 
and thousands upon thousands of Israelis are uh, have been evacuated, both from the northern border with Lebanon and from the area around uh, um, uh, around the Gaza Strip. Um, a whole list of issues, uh, economic support for businesses that are uh, going under because of the war. In all of these areas, the government has uh, has proved itself incapable of dealing with the problems. Um, fortunately, it, it, and this is one of the um, strange aspects of the situation here, the protest organizations, which sprung up during the nine months of the public political battle against Netanyahu's regime change plans, transformed themselves the night of the attack into a vast philanthropic network, used their social media and WhatsApp and other networks to enlist volunteers, and have mounted a huge volunteer effort to help citizens and to help soldiers going to the front. Um, so civil society in Israel has proven um, resilient and fairly united, but the government has continued to be really not with it. Mm -hmm. um, and that has increased the frustration and the anger with Netanyahu, as far as I can tell, without trying to say that I know what every Israeli thinks or what they will think tomorrow, because moods change quickly in situations like this. Of course. Um, U.S. National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan said on CNN over the weekend that the IDF, the Israeli government, should be taking every possible means available to, distinct, to them to distinguish between Hamas, terrorists who are legitimate military targets, and civilians who are not. He continued that Hamas has been using civilians as human shields and putting rockets and other terrorist infrastructure in civilian areas. And he went on to say that it doesn't lessen their Israel's responsibility under international uh, humanitarian law and the laws of war to do all in their power to protect the civilian population. As you know, there's been thousands of Palestinians that have been casualties due to Israeli airstrikes. Now a larger ground invasion into Gaza has begun. Do you believe Netanyahu is responding appropriately as the world is watching his leadership? Well, first of all, I would say that in terms of being an internal leader, he hasn't responded uh, um, as a strong leader. He has not spoken to the nation. He has not explained his actions well to the nation. I mean, he's made these occasional speeches, but... It, President Biden showed more empathy and connection to human beings in a few hours visiting in Israel than Prime Minister Netanyahu has since the war broke out. It's astonishing. Um, it, beyond that, uh, the messaging from the government and the explanations of its actions have been atrocious. Um, the government, in fact, has a responsibility to make sure that its targets are military. It is a reality that the Hamas military infrastructure is buried deeply inside of the civilian uh, structure. Um, and at the very least, the government has a responsibility to do a much better job of explaining what the targets are and that, that it's aiming at military targets and only at military targets. Um, what has been going on is horrific. I would be very happy if this war wasn't happening. I also understand that uh, that there is a real military conflict going on here, and the government is not doing its job to explain why and where the strikes are going on or why these are military, with certain exceptions. But overall, the explanation of what has happened internally and externally has been um, has has been extremely weak. Um, I would say, and because of that, it only increases the impression that civilians are the target, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, that this does not have to do with defense or with uh, you know preventing another attack. Um, so that that is a a uh, is a major issue here. 
Um, beyond that, I would say that I think that the discussion of the damage to civilians in Gaza is essential, that Israel has a responsibility to do its best to minimize civilian casualties, but that it, outsiders, including the media and foreign leaders, should be much clearer about the fact that the number one enemy of civilians in Gaza is, in fact, Hamas. It's Hamas that has brought this war upon Gaza. It's Hamas that has used its rule in Gaza for the past 16 years uh, as a military base against Israel instead of uh, uh, focusing on the welfare of Palestinian residents. And it's Hamas that's built a military infrastructure under under the civilian uh, communities uh, of Gaza. Um, and it's... Uh, um, I think that that's a point. The the stress, the necessary stress to Israel that it should avoid civilian casualties sometimes seems one-sided in a way that says, well, we understand that Israel is a rational and moral actor, so we can appeal to Israel to avoid civilian casualties. There's no point in appealing to Hamas. Um, because we don't consider them moral or rational actors. Well, if that's the case, if that's your reasoning, then it should be much more explicit. This is a very difficult, loaded question. But what do you believe the future is for the Israel-Hamas war? I make it a point as a journalist never to report the future. I will say to you that I have been a journalist here for 40 years. Um, and every important development in the region has completely surprised the experts, including this latest war. I do my best to report what is happening and what has happened. I will not report what's going to happen next. And the world is watching. And I think it would be even from my my social circles, my my friend groups, we're all we're all uh, aware of how pivotal this is in in our world's history, in the next steps of what this means, not only for Israel, not only for Gaza, not only for the Middle East, but how this can all trickle um, to other parts of our world. So um, thank you for taking your time for, for having the historical insight and also to be able to help us contextualize and keep us up to beat on what's going on. Thank you. Thank you.